<laughs> As you know, George Miller's Mad Max saga is famous for its wild stunts and immersive world building that has led to the creation of the ultimate post-apocalyptic thrill ride we've all come to love today. Even with the latest edition of the franchise's first prequel film, Furiosa, a Mad Max saga has consistently lived up to its reputation of bloody insanity. Through the Mad Max franchise, Miller has really carried forward the torch for Osploitation, but this wouldn't have been possible without the first Mad Max film released in 1979. Osploitation is known to serve a mind-blowingly violent genre of fun, mostly built around a low budget, and with the first Mad Max, Miller established a similar theme set in Australia. Apparently, he used funds from his own pockets to breed out a film that naturally thrives on chaos and danger. But surprisingly, the Mad Max films are not really the most unhinged collection in this category. If this genre is something up your alley, well, you guys might want to check out Wake in Fright. This 1971 cult classic is so intense that you might find yourself wanting to look away from the screen while also sneaking in for more. But one thing is for sure, for people who have carved out a certain scenario of Australia in their head without even visiting the place, well, let's just say that Wake in Fright will make you think twice about visiting Australia, or even about having another drink. And that's exactly why the film is considered a cornerstone of modern Australian cinema. Directed by Ted Kotcheff, it documents the harrowing adventure of a schoolteacher who spirals into despair while being stuck in a remote outback town after being constantly tormented by drunken, unhinged locals. So, without wasting another moment, let's find out what this Australian masterpiece is all about. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. This cult classic normalizes the concept of horror in plain sight. In a small two-building town in the Australian desert of Tibunda, a young hapless schoolteacher dressed in a suit and tie lights up a cigarette and orders a beer at an otherwise empty hotel bar. He seems to be waiting for the afternoon train that'll take him to the next town, where he'll catch a flight home to Sydney for the holidays. The grumpy bartender, who also happens to be his landlord, sets down the beer without bothering to remove the large head of foam. The teacher lifts the glass, notices the excessive foam, but stays silent, while the bartender pours himself a perfect beer. Wake in Fright is about John Grant, the schoolteacher stuck in a job he despises, consistently living a dull life where his only social interaction is with the local bartender. All he wants is to escape to Sydney for the Christmas break to see his hot swimsuit-clad girlfriend, who we often see through flashbacks, and get away from his usual suffocating routine. Now, in order to catch his flight to Sydney, John has to take a train to the Yabba, a small outback mining town that has an unhealthy obsession with drinking, causing aggravating trouble and a bizarre cult-like respect for the dead and the survival of the fittest. This beer-soaked, heat-struck sprawl is actually called Bundan Yabba, but the locals call it the Yabba. And it fits, because it sounds more like a panting animal than a town. While the sound of Bundan Yabba seems mundane and almost goofy, the Yabba sends a shiver down your spine. And it should, because the Yabba is a place where the hidden, dark parts of your soul come crawling out from under the rocks. Anyways, while waiting for his train, John tries to blend in with the locals, and that's how he meets Jock Crawford, a cop who shows him the ropes, including the unspoken rule of having to look after himself and drinking as many beers as possible in order to avoid being seen as an outsider. Jock introduces John to his friend, Doc Tyden, who's just the first in a group of wild men who drag John into a whirlwind of absolute disgust and depravity. It's easy to call it a nightmare, but what's truly disturbing is just how normal the horror John experiences seems to be. On the surface, Wake and Fright has a lot in common with the Twilight Zone, you know, the gig where an ordinary protagonist is made to stumble into a whole string of strange circumstances and ultimately comes out after it learning a moral lesson. However, while the Twilight Zone often used supernatural elements and the unsettling sense of a cosmic alternate dimension that keeps trampling the lives of its residents like bugs, Wake in Fright is different. There's nothing inherently supernatural or even particularly unusual about the people and situations that John encounters, but that's exactly where the horror lies, and how disturbingly normal it all is. Just on his first night in the Yabba, we see John Grant lose his plane ticket and all his money after getting himself into an endless spiral of drinking and gambling. Well, that's just Friday, because by the early hours of Monday, he finds himself passed out on a stranger's porch, surrounded by empty beer cans and broken glass. A man with a devilish grin tells him that his culture and education are worthless here, and that in the Yabba, he'll discover his true unsettling humanity, and for the very first time in his life, John will be forced to confront who he really is. If it weren't for how quickly the Yabba becomes both threatening and invasive to John, it'd almost be funny how obvious the punchline is, at least to the audience. But this is a classic fish-out-of-water comedy turned into a living nightmare of being trapped by drunken masculinity. They say there's a thin line between comedy and horror, and probably John's wild adventure could have been a hilarious party movie like The Hangover. However, under the direction of Ted Kotcheff, it becomes an uncomfortable, sweat-drenched experience. 
Everyone might be laughing throughout Wake in Fright, ironically even John at times, but soon it becomes obvious that there's nothing remotely funny about the Outback's twisted funhouse wasteland of the soul that we get to see here. Broken, I can't afford to drink. What's that gonna do with it, man? I said I'd buy you a drink. You don't have to buy me. Wake in Fright was boldly ahead of its time due to its interpretation of toxic conformity. To just give you a glimpse of how dire things are about to become, the film wastes no time to explore how even the relatively safer part of civilization that John is so well aware of is simply lifeless and desolate. It opens with a stunning 360-degree aerial shot of John's hometown, revealing nothing but vast, empty stretches of reddish dirt, thin lines that barely qualify as roads, and one single train station. Even on a calm day, like when we first meet John, everyone's already drenched in their own sweat, with pit stains and droplets covering their faces as they try to drink or socialize in peace. But when John arrives in the Yabba, things really don't improve as his hotel room has only small useless fans for the sake of air conditioning, and by morning, the air is already shimmering with unbearable heat waves. The poor front desk clerk tries to cool off by dripping water onto a cell from a sad little glass. John was already very uncomfortable with all this, but you know what could make it worse? More people. The Yabba is packed with people most of whom seem quite invested in spending the days binge drinking without any ambition. John might have been able to overlook this, but somehow every guy he meets in this town is determined to figure out whether he's an outsider and test him. Even Jock gets to know John by offering him drinks, constantly drowning his own in one go, and then staring at John until he does the same. After that, when Jock insists on buying him more drinks, John always seems to give in. It's also Jock who's the one telling John how he needs to fend for himself, and then goes on to introduce him to gambling. As Jock brings him to Doc, he essentially hands John's soul over to the Tasmanian Devil's hiding in plain sight. Given that he's desperate to escape his lowly teaching job, John convinces himself that gambling will give him the money he needs to leave that mundane hell for good. Quite predictably, this of course backfires, leaving him nearly broke and destitute, while setting off a series of unfortunate events that inherently splits John's nerves and forces him to reveal his darker side. But as you dig deeper into waking fright, it also takes you deeper into the horrors of the Yabba, where you find yourself sinking into a quagmire of much more uncomfortable truths. After Grant survives his first suffocating night in the Yabba, loses his money and finds himself stranded, he ends up with a group of local men. Now, Grant doesn't like these men as he's the type of person who feels uneasy when a stranger offers him a beer, and even more uneasy when they confront him with confusion and anger just because he refused the said beer. This particular detail really struck a chord with me on my first watch, especially how these people took it so personally when John declined not to join them in their binge drinking culture. But since the labor exchange is closed on weekends, what else can Grant do except for going along with these men and their drunken whims? After all, what harm have they done to him, besides buying him drinks and offering him a place to stay? From John's point of view, in a way they've been nothing but kind to him, and he resents them only because their kindness is wrapped up in backslapping, crude jokes, and beer. So if you uh, think about it, John actually resents them for being the sort of men that they are. Alcohol is the main villain in this film. So, when John swaps his drinks with a sweaty man named Tim, he's pressured to join him for dinner and more drinks at his home. Here, he again finds himself face to face with Doc and their friends, Joe and Dick. Despite John trying to get away from this pack, everyone almost bullies him to join in, all while silently noting the resigned helplessness of Tim's daughter, Jeanette. Doc especially targets John taking every opportunity to discuss his nihilistic views on humanity's attempts to civilize through violence, constantly hinting at the absurdity in Australia's and humanity's history of colonization. The inherent tension between John and Doc only intensifies due to Doc's intense focus on human psychology, particularly regarding why they feel the need to have sex. Now, there's somewhat of an underlying suggestion of homoerotic tension here, with Doc clearly desiring for a closer relationship with John. We never get to know whether John reciprocates this desire, as his memories are hazy from the night before, full of heavy drinking with the boys. This dynamic basically keeps happening quite frequently, with the group coaxing John to indulge in his buried immoralities from his middle-class life. But the most notable consequence is John rediscovering his skill with guns, which ultimately leads us to the most disturbing scene in the film, the kangaroo hunt. Wake in Fright's most controversial kangaroo hunt. So, coming to the best part that I've saved for the last, one night, John and the boys get drunk and decide to pull out the guns, get out in the car, and go kangaroo hunting. The camera work in the car captures the chaotic intensity of the moment with shots from the front window and along the side as they speed through the desert, kicking up huge orange dust clouds under the wheels. 
We see the kangaroos desperately sprinting away and ultimately meet their tragic ends, with their bodies bouncing against the trees, leaving trails of blood. The situation only gets worse when Joe gets up close to a kangaroo by himself and then proceeds to wrestle it and kill it by slitting its throat. John, who's as usual pressure to follow, ends up killing one too, stabbing it frantically while trying to avoid facing the brutality of his actions by facing the other way. Even if you're not easily nauseated by violence, this scene's incredibly disturbing, especially because of its hauntingly realistic portrayal and the sense of helplessness felt by the animals. What makes it even more unsettling is that it was all real. Those kangaroos were actually being stabbed and mutilated while filming. This scene wasn't at all scripted or staged or faked as the film crew simply tagged along a regular hunt. Even though it's a film that wants you to look at the face of the realities that's often ignored, the kangaroo hunt scene was marked as controversial and deranged in a way that the film became an actual kangaroo snuff film. But Kotcheff believed it was crucial to vividly explore John's moral decline and illustrate just how low a dull small-town school teacher could have fallen. This is why he felt the kangaroo hunting scene was necessary. However, he faced a moral dilemma regarding how to film it without actually harming kangaroos. But this quickly changed when a crew member mentioned how hundreds of kangaroos were slaughtered every night in the outback, so the skins could be sold to tanneries while the meat could be turned into pet food. Apparently, Kotcheff initially had his crew film a session of these nightly slaughters, but realized that only 75% of the footage was too bloody and horrifying, so he decided to use the footage that he felt was appropriate, as the Australian Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals kept urging him to show the reality of what really happens in the outback. However, he omitted the most extreme footage, fearing it would shock his audience too much and drive them out of the theatres, screaming and throwing up. Despite his efforts, the kangaroo hunt scene still became deeply controversial, to a point that it received an 18 rating in Australia during its release. Ironically, when Wake in Fright was shown at the Cows Film Festival in 2009, almost 12 people chose to walk out of the theatre during the kangaroo hunting scene. Like Mad Max, John Grant is a horrifying representation of the darkness within us all. While watching Wake in Fright, I found myself wishing Grant would just leave during the long, hot, sluggish middle part of the movie. Throughout the film, Kotcheff builds the tension in such a manner that you simply find yourself waiting for something violent and terrible to happen. Through his direction, the streets of the town are filled with dark shadows. Even in the midday sun as the gambling men in the dive bar seem like a chaotic mass of bodies whose faces are illuminated by nightmarish red lights. When the lively atmosphere in the bar is abruptly halted by an Anzac memorial service, it turns into an unsettling red-lit thing rather than being just a simple ceremony commemorating fallen soldiers. I think Kotcheff was basically trying to show us that even in moments of honouring the fallen, there's a darker side of hypocrisy and violence that remains hidden. Honestly, every fibre of my being screamed that this place was dangerous, these people were dangerous, and something terrible was just waiting to happen. I reacted to Wake in Fright much like how we react to films like The Wicker Man or Get Out, where the protagonist happily ignores the warning signs flashing in bright red all around them. There's a thrilling anticipation in watching characters like Sergeant Howie and the Wicker Man keep choosing to stay, despite the unsettling smiles of the villagers and the strange pagan costumes lurking from the shadows. But what really sets Wake in Fright apart is that the horror isn't just in the sinister locals. In other films, we spend the entire movie knowing that those villagers are trouble. We can feel it in our gut, screaming at the protagonist to see what we see and leave. And when the climax comes, like when Sergeant Howie faces the Wicker Man, the payoff is that we were indeed right. Those people turn out to be truly monstrous, and with the assurance of our protagonist, being in danger all along, it really is a validation to our instincts as viewers. But in Wake in Fright, something different happens as no one attacks John Grant, no one tries to harm him, and no one even forces him to do anything. It's his own recklessness and greed that leads him to lose his money while gambling. His apathy and weakness drives him to keep drinking for days. It's also his carelessness and passive-aggressive behavior that lead him to go around mindlessly shooting kangaroos. And in a moment of heat and confusion, John ends up wrestling with the wounded kangaroo, clumsily plunging a knife into its side and covering himself in blood. What a gory mess. In a way, Grant willingly embraces all the degradation he experiences. He pretty much witnesses descent into darkness through a headlong screaming punch as he inevitably gives into it without even being aware. Kotcheff pretty much creates a sense of horror through the oppressive existence of leering unwashed men throughout the film. However, in the end, we find out that the horror isn't in them. There's no validation of our suspicions, no payoff because the true horror lies within Grant himself, who somehow reflects the darkness that exists within us all. And just when John thinks he can ignore what's inside him and revert to being that reserved school teacher, there's something there, grinning at his side, who won't let him forget. I think Donald Pleasance delivers the most powerful performance in the film as Doc Tyden, a character who turns out to be both skin-crawlingly repulsive and weirdly captivating. Despite coming from the big city like Grant, Doc embraces the raw physicality of the Abbot over culture and refinement. Although the Doc may seem like a beer-drinking, uncultured man, the twinkle in his eye reveals that he's aware and embraces it. What's challenging for Grant is that Doc has a knack for saying things that he can't easily argue against. When Grant complains about the town's uneducated and rough men, it's also Doc Tyden who highlights that the working life is a fate worse than death in the mines. 
At the end of the film, that is, after the homoerotic encounter John has with Doc, post the kangaroo hunt, he feels extremely repulsed and heads back to town. When he arrives, Crawford returns his two suitcases which he'd left at a hotel after meeting Tim. He decides to get rid of one of the suitcases, which mainly contains textbooks and starts wandering through the desert towards Sydney, hitchhiking with truck drivers when he can and using the rifle he got during the hunt to procure some food. Eventually, John arrives at a truck stop and convinces a driver, who he believes is heading to Sydney, to give him a lift. However, due to a misunderstanding, John somehow ends up back again in the Yabba. Now, evidently furious with Doc and his twisted behavior, John rushes to his empty cabin, planning to shoot him when he returns. But as he waits, he becomes strangely overwhelmed by loneliness and remorse, which ultimately drives him to turn the rifle on himself. When Doc arrives, he witnesses John shoot himself in the temple, and while the shot wounds John, it doesn't kill him. Following this, John recovers in the hospital and signs a statement from Crawford, explaining that his suicide attempt was indeed an unfortunate accident. Several weeks after his recovery, Doc takes him to the railway station, where they quietly make peace. Wake and Fright ends as John is no longer filled with the same contempt he had for the Outback's people, and returns back to Tibunda to start the new school year after feeling more assured of himself. It's usually said that man is ultimately the greatest monster in the universe, and Wake and Fright hits hard because it taps into this disturbing truth as the film opens with John Grant as a simple man and ends with him becoming a monster. The film explores how seemingly normal people are easily capable of doing terrible things when given the chance, especially if they're under the influence of alcohol. In the Yabba, this seems to be a rather common state, with men driven by a need for dominance and a strong desire to corrupt anyone who doesn't fit the mold by bringing them down to their level of deranged violence. This particular horror of toxic masculinity and its endless depravity is a horror that even the surreal cruelty or the intense survival races in Mad Max couldn't fully capture. With that being said, this film was lost over decades until it was restored in 2009. Now tell me, how many of you have been lucky enough to sit through this Australian horror masterpiece? Let me know of your thoughts about Ted Kotcheff's Wake in Fright in the comment box below. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and uh, be safe. Thanks everyone.